Thanks, first of all, for being here. I, they said probably we'll get 100 people today because it's Memorial Day weekend, and what an amazing group of people that are here today. I'm very impressed and glad to be here myself. A year ago, we were in Arizona for a Corpus Christi Sunday, and we went to Mass, and a very trendy hip priest got up and told us that nothing happened on the altar. He said, we're not talking about miracles or magic here. He said, what happened is Jesus taught everyone to share. They all had picnic baskets up under their robes. And they were all walking along out in the wilderness and got hungry, and Jesus taught them to share. The real miracle was that he taught greedy, selfish people to share with others. And everybody pulled the bread and fish out from under their robes, shared with everybody else, and before you knew it, everybody had enough food, and there was 12 basketfuls left over. I just about came out of my seat in the middle of that mass, and my wife, my good wife, she stepped on me and said, sit down. <laughs> there are times where I, I, I would stand up, but I, I didn't then. She said, go home and write. So I went home that afternoon and I wrote. I was, my fingers are flying on the keyboard, and it came out to be a 14-page letter called The Miracle That Never Happened. And it got published in this rock magazine, and if you want to see it, it's on my blog. I put it up again this time. There was a miracle that took place in the wilderness, and there's a miracle that takes place here. And any priest that says it isn't should be ashamed of himself. So that's why I wrote that article. And if you won't hear that in this parish, I'll guarantee it. Because I know these guys. That's why I'm here today, by the way. <clears throat> I came here out of my love for Father Steve and, and Father John. In fact, uh, Father Steve and I are going, uh, going in June to the Holy Land and to Jordan for uh, 14 days if you want to come along. But I used to be a Baptist. I wasn't always a Catholic. And if you'd invited me here, if Mar Margie had invited me here 15 years ago, I would have been just as enthusiastic and just as eager to be here, but for a completely different reason. I would have come here to get you all saved because I was convinced that all of you are going straight to hell, following the old man in Rome who led you with a false gospel and false ideas and the traditions of men and was leading you all right straight to hell. And if I'd have had a chance to come here and get you all born again and have believe in faith alone and become real Bible Christians, I would have been here in a heartbeat. And I, would, and I could go right back into my old shoes and do it right now. And I'll do a little bit of it here because I want you to understand what the Eucharist is and what the alternatives are. When I was a Protestant, I would have asked you, why do you come here and worship a piece of bread? My wife and I, she's in the back at the table there. She's the pretty blonde I've been married to for 32 years now. Best thing I ever did besides becoming a Catholic. We, we would challenge Catholics and say to them, why do you worship a piece of bread? Don't you understand that you're intelligent people? Some of you are even college educated, and yet you worship a piece of bread that's not intelligent. We had never been in a Catholic church, my wife and I. January 1st of 1994, we intellectually decided to become Catholics. At that point, we had never been inside of a Catholic church in our whole life out of principle. My wife is the first Catholic in her family in over 400 years. Both of our families rejected us when we became Catholics. We had never met a Catholic priest personally in our life, and we had never met a Catholic who could explain or defend the faith. Every time we met a Catholic and asked them, are you saved and going to heaven? They would say, well, we hope so. We haven't killed anyone. We're trying to be good. And I'd go, gotcha. You don't have a clue. I was convinced Catholics didn't have a clue, and most don't. And so when we became, uh, when we started to look at this whole idea of being Catholic, it was, it was totally bizarre to us and absurd to us at first. We would have said to you about this Eucharist, we called it a cookie Christ. We called it a graven bread. I even have a book at home still. I have the best anti-Catholic library of anybody, by the way, on my shelves. I have 20,000 books in my health house, and a whole bunch of them are anti-Catholic books because it's good to study those and keep up on what the opposition teaches. And I would have said that this was a cookie Christ, a graven bread. There's a book on my shelf called Graven Bread. Why? Because we are told never to make a graven image. And what do Catholics do? They take a piece of bread and they make it a graven image, graven bread, and they put it on the altar. And they bow and they worship this. 
Now, if I had to come here before, I would say to you, not only is it, for many educated people, not only is it stupid, but it is also idolatrous. You are to worship God alone. Why do you worship a piece of bread? But there was a, there's a really only a few alternatives. I'd go on like a Baptist preacher if I could, but I got to cover the good stuff here. There's really only a few alternatives of what, this, what really takes place and happens on this altar, what we experienced here for those who were here for Mass an hour ago. And it's like a sliding scale. At one end, we say that it is the body and blood of Christ. On the other end of the sliding scale, the other alternative we have is to say that it is a piece of bread. There's not a lot of wiggle room in between. It's one or the other. Now the Lutherans come along and say, well, it's consubstantiation, which means the presence of Jesus is with the bread. We, of course, say transubstantiation wasn't defined until after the 1200s. Doesn't mean it was invented in the 1200s. It was simply defined in the 1200s and given a scientific explanation. Transubstantiation means trans means change. Substantiation, substance, a change of substance. Luther said, no, it's a consubstantiation. Con means with. Christ becomes part of or with the substance. But in the big scale of the picture, you only have two really alternatives. It either is a piece of bread, which if that's the case, us Catholics are idolatrous and we are stupid and we are foolish. If it is only a piece of bread. Let's face it, if that's a piece of bread on the altar, then we're foolish to come here and worship it and eat it and think we're worship eating Jesus. But on the other hand, the other alternative is that it is Jesus. That it is his real presence. It is his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Now, if it is only a piece of bread, we've already talked about the implications of that for Catholics. We're foolish and idolatrous. But on the other hand, if it is Jesus, then what about my old position? Then I am mocking and making fun of and ridiculing one of the greatest, if not the greatest, gift of God that he's given to us in his church in the world, himself, to eat. And we are what we eat. So you have these two drastic contradictions and everyone in the world has to make a decision on which one it is, whether they like it or not. And if they're apathetic and just make a, a decision not to believe it by default, guess what? They've still made a decision that they believe that it is not the body and blood of Christ. And we, by faith, and for good and substantial reasons, it's not just because we have faith. Believe me, this does not become bread and wine because we believe it does. We believe it becomes bread and wine because it does. Our belief and faith doesn't make something come into existence. We believe it because it already is in existence. What happens on that altar is objective reality. It happens whether we believe it or not. What we believe it, and there are good and substantial reasons why we believe it. So I want to get into a little bit about the Protestant Reformation and what happened there. For the first 1,500 years, everybody believed that what happened on this altar was real and substantial and the bread and the wine became the body and blood of Christ. In my book, Crossing the Tiber, the last one-third of that book deals with the Eucharist from the Old Testament and the New Testament and the first five centuries of the church. And I show that there was a continuity all the way through. There was no broken line of continuity. It was the body and blood of Jesus, even to the point where Tertullian said in the third century that if a piece falls on the ground, everybody is in, in distress. What do we do? It's, it fell on the ground. You don't get worried about a piece of bread falling on the ground. It happens at our house all the time. We have three grandkids living there with us. Not just bread gets thrown on the ground. Everything does. It's no big deal. But why did the Tertullian, why did the early Christians, why were they so upset if a piece of the Eucharist fell to the ground? Because from the very beginning, the very first Christians believed that this was the body and blood of Christ. It's no longer bread. And in my book, I have a little chapter called A Short History of the Resistance. It's short because there was none. Everybody believed in that. It didn't come about until what some, what we call the Reformation, but what I refer to as the rebellion. And I was part of the rebellion. That's why I got the right to call it that if I want to. 
But in, 19, in, in 1529, Martin Luther and the Reformers went up to Marburg, Germany. And in 1982 and in 1985, my wife and I sold everything and went and spent a year driving around Europe studying our Protestant Reformation, our history. We went to the places of Martin Luther and John Calvin and Farrell and Bucer and these guys to learn about it. And in 1529, Martin Luther and Calvin and Bucer and all these reformers, what some people call the magisterial reformers, the first ones, went to, Mount, to the Mount Marburg. There's a mountain there and there's a castle. And they had a meeting because they said how foolish it would be if we broke away from the one church to start something new and found out that we were all fragmented and not agreeing among ourselves. We need to be very careful that we all agree together so we don't discredit ourselves. Oh, would they be surprised today? But even then they saw it happen because at that very meeting they saw that they couldn't agree. Martin Luther slammed his fist on the big oak table and said, it says, he wrote a chalk on the table, this is my body. He said, I will not be moved from this. He doesn't believe it anymore like the Catholics do, but he still believes that something happens there on the altar. But Zwingli said, it's all symbolic. It's all a deception of the Catholics. It's all symbolic. Jesus is talking about faith, not about anything that really happens here. And they argued and fought. And by the end of that meeting there in Marburg, they went away, many of them, refusing to shake hands with the other, saying, you are no longer a brother of mine. This is only 10 years after Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the Wittenberg door. Ten years later. Fifty years later, there was a book written entitled 200 Definitions of the Words, This is My Body. Up until that time, they had all agreed that this is my body meant the same thing. Now, 50 years after Martin Luther started his rebellion, they couldn't agree. 200 Definitions. Jimmy Swaggart wrote in his book, it used to be very famous before his fall from grace, the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation is without question one of the most absurd doctrines ever imposed on a trusting public. Roman Catholic errors are inevitably human innovations that were inserted into the church during the early centuries. The teaching of the Eucharist follows that pattern. Shame on him, Jimmy Swaggart. He didn't do his homework because when you go back and read the very first Christians, they believed in the real presence. I usually save this for the end, but it fits in right now. One of my favorites, and we just finished the DVD on the Apostolic Fathers that we filmed in four countries, and the reason that I did it is because these Apostolic Fathers, they are very dangerous guys if you're not a Catholic or if you're not a faithful Catholic. These guys, when I read their writings, convinced me that the very earliest Christians were Catholics. I always had been taught they were Protestants. The Catholic Church only came about in the Middle Ages after it got corrupted with all these human man-made ideas. The early pristine church was Protestant, faith alone, Bible alone, even though they didn't have a Bible for the first 400 years. I mean, don't confuse me with the facts. The fact is, is that this is what we thought. And when I went back in my whole conversion process and I said in, in the movie that we did on Apostolic Fathers to prove all of this, by the way, it's a great movie to give to Protestants. It just takes the, the groundwork right out from under them. I said that these apostolic fathers twisted my arm behind my back and dragged me kicking and screaming into the Catholic Church. Ignatius of Antioch, I'll just give you one example. Being taken from Antioch in, Rome, uh, in Syria, it's now in Turkey, Antakya. We filmed his life there. On his way, chained to ten Roman soldiers on his way to Rome to be fed to the lions. He said to the churches along the way, he wrote seven letters. If you haven't read them, do it. He wrote and said, beware of the heretics who deny, who, ref who refrain or refuse to partake of the Eucharist. Why? Because they deny that it is the very blood, the body and blood of Jesus who died on the cross. The very flesh of Jesus who died. They deny it so they won't take part in it. I was one of them. And here's the first Christian. How did Ignatius know what to do here at the altar? We know what, how Father John and Father Steve know what to do at the altar. They went to seminary. They've been practicing this. They learned it all in seminary. And they've been watching it all their life. How did Ignatius of Antioch, a bishop in the first century, how did he know what to do at the altar on Sunday morning? Very simply, he sat here in the front row and watched Peter, Paul, and John. 
He watched Jesus' disciples, what they did here, and then he spread the, that news even during their lifetime. And in 107, before he died, wrote, Beware of the heretics because they do not accept that the Eucharist is the very same flesh of Jesus who died on the cross and was risen again. And it didn't sound very Baptist to me. And in my book, Crossing the Tiber, I've got all these quotes from the fathers for the first five centuries. So what I want to do today then, knowing that that happened and knowing what I believed as a Baptist, I want to go back and give you a little idea, a defense of the Eucharist and how I struggled to come to the place where I am today. And I want to first start out with the Old Testament and then the New Testament and then our experiences. So it'll be kind of the three categories I'm going to do. First of all, I want to talk about how the Old Testament prepared us for the Eucharist. Having Corpus Christi this Sunday, it really applies, the body of Christ. How does the Old Testament prepare us? First of all, we have to forget that we're Americans for a little bit and think of ourselves as being Jewish. Why? Because that is what our foundation and our roots are, Jewish. We're Americans. We speak English. We're 2,000 years removed. We have the New Testament, which is only about this thick. But what we have to realize is the New Testament was built upon the Old Testament, which is about this thick. Much thicker than the New Testament. We're the church. We are the leaves, the branches, the fruits, the flowers. But what is the trunk and the root? It's Israel. It was the people of God in the land of Israel with him working with them. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right now I'm working frantically to finish a study guide of 400 pages on the book of Genesis. And it is the history of us. It's us. We're Abraham is our father of faith. And guess what? He wasn't an American. He didn't speak English. He wasn't a Catholic. He wasn't even a Jew at the time. He was a Hebrew, he was called. He was the father of the nation of Israel. And so we have to think of ourselves, and when we think about the Eucharist, and we think about the church, when we think about our salvation, all of it, to understand it completely, we have to take off our American Baptist glasses, and we got to think like Jews. I always say that I used to wear Baptist glasses. Everything I saw looked Baptist. If, I, if you wear red glasses, what does the world look like? Red if you have blue glasses, sunglasses, what does the world look like? Blue. If you wear Baptist glasses, what did the world look like? Baptist. And so does the Bible. Now I've got very special ones. This is a Jewish lens and a Catholic lens. <laughs> because that's how we have to understand the world and reality and the Bible and everything around us. It's not just religion. Catholicism is not just in these four walls. It is the cosmos. It is reality. Christianity is the only explanation of reality. And so we have to think in this terms of Jewishness. So I want to go back and look at the Old Testament a little bit, the Jewish background. Adam and Eve, let's start there. It's a good place to start. They sin against God and what has to happen? God has to kill an animal to cover them. Adam and Eve covered themselves with fig leaves, right? Well, I did a little research on fig trees and found out that the sap in fig trees and the branches, the leaves, everything else, has a chemical in it which causes dermatitis. It causes the skin to itch and get a rash. Adam and Eve tried to cover their own sins. They went and got fig leaves, put them on, and they're walking around scratching. You can't cover your own sins. It never works. It's going to make the problem worse. If you want your sins covered, you have to have the death of an animal. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And God had to kill an innocent animal to make skins to cover Adam and Eve. And it's already a picture of the sacrifice of what's going to happen for us in Jesus Christ and the Lamb of God. And next, go to Melchizedek. When I take our groups to Israel, I stand up on the promenade in Jerusalem and I, got, I can point out everything because Jerusalem's like the palm of our hand down there in the valley. And I can point out everywhere, and right there, and that right there where those two valleys meet is where Abraham met Melchizedek when he was coming back from war. And there, Abraham, representing the people of God, offers Melchizedek 10% of the spoils, a tithe. And Melchizedek, being the king of Salem, guess where that name comes from? Jeru Salem. He is there as the Prince of Peace, representing who? He's a prefigurement of Jesus Christ. And what does he give to Abraham? He gives him bread and wine in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is very Eucharistic. Then we go to the Passover lamb in Egypt. 
Moses and the children of Israel are in slavery and they need to escape. How do they escape? By the death of an animal. A lamb has to be slain. And you know, we think of the temple in Jerusalem and uh, these sacrifices is kind of clean and sanitary. But there was one time in Jerusalem where they killed over 250,000 Passover lambs at one Passover. Can you imagine killing 250? That's a quarter of a million lambs. They cut their throats. They hang them by the back legs over the altar until all the blood drips out onto the altar. And at this time, there were so many lambs killed, they had to have a bucket brigade. They had to kill them out into the courtyards, put their blood in buckets and pass it up to the altar to dump on the altar. It was like a slaughterhouse in Jerusalem. You ever smelled blood? I went to a, when I did our Moses movie, I went to a slaughterhouse to get real blood and it was nasty. It smelled bad and coagulated. I won't even go into any more of that. But they said, Passover lamb... Moses had to kill the Passover lamb, each family, and then they had to pass through water, and above was a spirit, water and spirit, by the way, being born again through water baptism, and they ate the special bread out in the wilderness. But the Passover lamb had to die, and Jesus is our Passover lamb, and that's going to be more important for us as we go along in this. And then another image of the Eucharist in the Old Testament is the manna. Out in the wilderness of Sinai, the manna fell from the sky. They were hungry. And I don't blame them. You know, they say that we read this Old Testament passages about how they grumbled and complained. I'd have been the first one in the line to grumble and complain against Moses. Have you ever been through Sinai and through those areas of Jordan? It is miserable. Sandstorms blow and we see snow in three-foot drifts here. They said sand in three-foot drifts there. And they're going for days without water, days without food. And then all of a sudden God gives them a great miracle. The manna comes down from the heaven and they walk out and they look at it and they have no idea what happened, what it was. Do you know what the word manna means? When they walked out of their tents in the morning and looked out and saw these flakes on the ground, they said, what is it? And in Hebrew, manna means what is it? Manna means what is it? So that's the Hebrew word. So really they walked out and they saw the what is it on the ground. (laughs) That applies in a little bit later when the Jews walked away from Jesus when he explained that you must eat me, the the meat, the bread that's come down from heaven and they walk away because they said, what is it? What are you talking about? And they walked away. But that's the manna. The manna is the bread of life come down from heaven. Jesus said in John chapter 6, if you eat the, the, your Moses and the fathers, they ate the bread which came down and they still died. But you, if you eat the bread of life, me, you will never die. And then in Micah, that brings us right to Micah since we're talking about bread. In Micah chapter 5 verse 2 is the prophecy that Bethlehem is going to be the place O you Bethlehem, O you Freta, who are little among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth the one to be the ruler of Israel. What does Bethlehem mean? I have a picture of me hitchhiking to Bethlehem under a sign that says Bethlehem, two words. Bethlehem, house of bread. Mary, what's in her womb on the donkey as she's going from Nazareth, that eight or ten day journey through the 120 degree temperatures or whatever it was through the Jordan Valley to Bethlehem? What's in her womb when she's riding that donkey with flies buzzing around her head? The bread of life. Mary is going to the house of bread to deliver the bread. And where does she put the bread when she gets there? And you go, when we take our pilgrims into the lower level of the Church of Nativity in Bethlehem, there are two little shrines there. One is the place where you reach down and touch the ground where Mary gave birth to Jesus. And then you take a few steps down here and there's another one where you stop and touch our rosaries and pray. And this is the place where she put Jesus in the manger in the cave, and it's still a cave today with a church built over it. Why did Mary put Jesus in the manger? What is a manger? A manger is a food dish for sheep. We're the sheep of God from the very beginning. Mary is telling us that he is going to become our food. She puts him in a dish where the sheep come to eat. From the very beginning, we learn that he's going to be our food placed in the dish for the sheep. And this is in Bethlehem, the house of bread. We're already being told, even in that verse, the best way to study the Bible. People say to me, Steve, how do you study the Bible? I say, ask as many dumb questions as you can and then find answers. Why Bethlehem? Why? Because it's the house of bread. And this is where the bread is going to be born. 
This is how the fathers thought about the scriptures. This is how the Jews worked with the passages. It's so exciting to study the Bible. There's nothing else quite like it. But anyway, we're going to move on. One more I'm going to tell you about in Malachi 1.11 where Malachi prophesied and he said, From the setting of the sun, from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations and in every place incense offered to my name, a pure offering will be made among the nations. Another translation says, From east to west. The Jews have a problem with a passage like this because the sacrifices were given to them and they were to be performed in the temple in Jerusalem which God had called the place for the sacrifices is in Jerusalem and here it says that there is going to be a pure sacrifice, a pure offering offered among the nations. The Gentile goyim dogs, how can they offer a pure sacrifice? They're filthy dogs. They're not a part of the covenant of God. They're uncircumcised. Even today, there's still this attitude with, with the, some of the very religious, religious Jews. When we were filming the Paul DVD, I was at the Western Wall. And I was there with my camera, and I was talking as we walked along the Western Wall with all the Jews praying. And I said, Paul loved the temple. Jesus loved the temple. And as soon as the word Jesus came out of my mouth, two Hasidic Jews just started to tremble and shake and came rushing up to me and said, you cannot say that name here. And I said, yes, I can. I have a permit. But they said, no, you can film here, but you cannot say that name. And there was a big argument ensued over whether I could use the name Jesus or not. And one stood in front of me right in my face and the other one stood right in front of my camera saying that I couldn't film. He was going to stand right there until I promised not to say that name again. Very incarnational, by the way, when to think about that. If I'd have been back in the first century, I'd have been taken out and stoned for the name. The only way I could get, by the way, the rabbis came, the police came, it was a big argument. The only way I could finally get him to get away from my camera was I said to him, okay, I am a Gentile, you are a Jew. If you don't get away from my camera, I'm going to touch you. (laughs) I'm a goyim dog, I'm unclean. He would have to go through ceremonial cleansings before Shabbat, the Sabbath. How could the Gentiles offer a pure sacrifice to God from east to west on an altar, no less? It's a problem. But you go through the fathers of the church and you'll find that one right after another, right after another, when they start even from the second century explaining what happens on the altar, they use this verse. This is the Eucharist prophesied by Micah the prophet 500 years before the time of Christ. I want to go to the New Testament. We could do a whole hour just on the New Testament. But I'm just going to touch on two points. Jesus says, this is my body. In the upper room, in Jerusalem, on Mount Zion. Three sacraments were instituted in this room. The priesthood, the Eucharist, and confession. It's also where the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost. If you don't get goosebumps when you walk into that room, I still do after 55 times. But here, Jesus, when he is celebrating the Passover meal with the bread and the wine, the matzah bread and the wine and everything he says, he holds up a piece of that bread and he says, this is my body. Now, when I looked at that with my Baptist glasses, there was an extra word added in there. It says, this represents my body. When I took it off and read it, it said, this is my body. This represents my body. Hmm. I was looking through a lens of tradition. I didn't go to the Bible alone and let it speak for itself. The Bible says what it means and it means what it says. Except here. I was looking through my Baptist tradition and letting my Baptist tradition interpret the scriptures for me. It doesn't say this represents my body. Jesus said this is my body. And St. Augustine, early church, says when Jesus spoke those words, he held his own flesh in his own hands. I like to ask people like me back 15 years ago, Steve, back in your old life, wouldn't you have thought it would be smart to maybe go up and talk to Jesus at that point and say, Jesus, you know, we really ought to reword that, what you just said. You know, there's going to be a billion Catholics someday that think you really meant what you just said. Maybe we should reword that, Lord. How arrogant is that? Jesus said what he said. This is my body. 
And his followers from that moment on through 1,500 years believed that he meant what he said and he said what he meant. So why didn't I? Then I go to another passage in John chapter 6. The famous passage about the bread of life which comes down from heaven. If you eat this bread, you will never die. And this is eat my flesh and drink my blood. If you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, there is no life in you. If you want to rise from the dead, you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And St. Ignatius, by the way, in the first century, guess what he writes? He says that the Eucharist, this on the altar, the Eucharist, which is the body and blood of Christ, it is the medicine of immortality. It is the way to eternal life. Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, there's no life in you. Well, as a Protestant, I'd say, of course, well, I didn't eat it, and I still sense the life of God in me. I'm full of the Holy Spirit. Well, first of all, we have to realize that the catechism teaches, just like baptism for some who aren't baptized, and yet they still experience the graces of God. But God made baptism and the Eucharist, all of these, necessary for salvation. However, there's a line at the bottom, and I forget which paragraph it is in the catechism. I think it's 847, somewhere in that range, where he says, but God himself is not bound to the sacraments. In other words, God can work outside of the sacraments when he wants to, though he made the sacraments the vehicle of salvation. For example, how did you all get here today? You drove in a car. How many of you walked here? How many of you rode bikes here or came here in an airplane? Almost all of you walked here, right? There are other ways to get here. But the normal means of coming to the church on Saturday morning are by driving in a car. The normal means of salvation is through baptism and the Eucharist. But God is not bound to his own sacraments and he can work outside of them if and when he chooses. So John chapter 6 says that unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And I want to just talk about that passage a little bit. Now in the three gospels prior to John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're called synoptic gospels, meaning sin with and optic seeing, seeing together with, they're very similar. John is very different. And in the first three gospels, you have the institution of the Eucharist right before the crucifixion where Jesus institutes the Eucharist, said this is my body, this is my blood, the cup, drink, you know, do this in memory of me. But in John, we don't hear that story. We, don't un we never go into the upper room for the institution of the Eucharist. Why? Because John wrote much later in life. And it says that he wrote a spiritual gospel. That, pe that the follower said, would you please tell us things the others haven't told us. So John wrote his gospel around 90 to 100 AD when he was an old man, full of the Holy Spirit, 70 years of having the Holy Spirit work in his life. And he writes and he says, I'm going to tell you not about the institution of the Eucharist, but I'm going to give you the theology underlying it. And so in John chapter 6, it starts out just like the others does. It's the time of Passover. John wants you to know I'm talking about the same thing, so I'm going to bookend it, open and close it the same way as the others do. So it's the time of the Passover, and at the end he concludes it with, he refers to Judas, who the devil was going to come into and walk away. All of four of them end, start and end the same way, so John's letting you know. He also, by the way, uses in this John chapter 6 several times a word that's not usually used for thanksgiving, but the word Eucharistia is woven into that passage in John chapter 6 and read by the first century Christians who received it. They knew that John was referring to the Eucharist, even by the fact that he used the word Eucharist in there three times. Eucharistia, two or three times. Jesus is saying, I'm the bread come down from heaven. Unless you eat of me, you can't live. And the Jews argue with them. I had one Protestant when I became Catholic argue with me. He said, Steve, I know that that cannot be the body and blood of Christ. And I said, how do you know that? And he says, because, he said, if it's really Jesus' body, you Catholics have certainly eaten it all up by now. If you've been there for 2,000 years, millions and billions of you, how long do you think it took to eat up every ounce of his body? It's gone by now. And I said, oh, you should read your Bible. What did Jesus do immediately before talking about the bread? He multiplied the loaves and fishes. You would think with only five loaves and two fish, how long would it take to eat all of that up? And yet, what did Jesus do? By a miracle, as they kept pulling it out, there was still more fish and more bread and more fish until they were tell. And in the, heat, in the Greek, it said there was a superabundance left over. 
So I said to him, if Jesus can give a superabundance from five loaves and two fishes, he can certainly continue to give us his flesh and his blood for the all of eternity if he has to, but certainly until he comes again. Touche. I, he said he'd come back with another one. But. So when, the, when Jesus argued this way, what did the Jews do? They argued with him and said that most of his disciples left. They were arguing. But then Jesus, because they were arguing, he ups the ante. He speaks tougher. He gets determined. He's speaking about eating bread. And the word eat is for fine dining. It's probably what my wife and I will do this afternoon or to, to go out to dinner or something tonight and we'll eat with spoons and forks. It's called eating. It's a polite dining and you're eating bread or regular food. But once they argue, Jesus says, okay guys, if you want to know, I'm going to tell it to you right straight. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, there's no life in you. And the word, he changes the word from eat, which is fine dining, to a Greek word called trogo. In the Greek, if you read in the Greek, see you don't see it because you read English. And the word eat is used all the way through. But if you read it in Greek, you'd see one Greek word for eat. And then he changes to a word called trogo, which means gnaw and munch and masticate and chew. The vision is of a dog munching on a bone like this. No wonder they're scandalized. They're scandalized just that they have to eat the bread. Come down. But now he's saying you have to gnaw and munch and chew on my flesh and drink my blood or there's no life in you. Well, you'd all be scandalized too. How many of you would have stayed around to hear any more of this nonsense? Jews said, that's nonsense. This is a hard saying. As Jews, we can't even touch a dead body. Do you know that you can't touch a dead body or you have to go through a period of days of cleansing? Even if you accidentally touch a dead body and drink blood, are you kidding? There's a, and even today... The kosher laws require that you are not allowed to eat meat with the blood still in it. Jews can't just go to Kroger's and buy meat there because it's not kosher. We kill animals differently than the Jews. The Jews have to still slice the throat and make sure all the blood is out before they can cook it. And you're telling me you have to, we have to drink... We can't even drink the blood of a cow or a goat and now we have to drink human blood? You are nuts! And they walk away. Let's face it, we probably would have too. And then he asked to P to Peter, are you going to walk away? Well, first of all, let's look at this. When they walked away, only the, the 12 remained. It looks like it's, that's the only ones left to talk to. And why didn't Jesus, as they're all walking away, saying, he's crazy, he's talking nonsense. Why didn't he just call them back and say, guys, I'm only speaking symbolically, let me explain. I don't really mean flesh and blood. Come on, guys, you know me better than that. But he didn't call them back because he did mean what he said. And Jesus then looked at the 12 and he said, are you also going to leave? And Peter, the big mouth, the one that's always blurting out things that are wrong, but this time he got it right, said, no, we're going... No, we're not going to leave, Jesus, but I have to admit to you, we don't have a clue what you're talking about. <laughs> we have every inclination to leave with those guys. We think this is awful scandalous, too. We don't have a clue, Jesus, you know, we don't really understand it. But we've been with you now for a long time, and we've seen your miracles, and we have become convinced that you are the Son of God. I set it up in Banya, Caesarea Philippi. Remember, Jesus, I said under the inspiration from your Father that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we know who you are, so you must there must be some sense in what you're saying, but we don't know what it is, but we're going to believe you. We're just going to trust you that you know what it means and that someday you'll let us know and you'll explain it to us. So you are the only one that has the words of eternal life, so we're going to stay with you. That's what I say. That's what you... We, I'm not going to try and explain all of what happens here, but I believe it because he tells me so. And we'll get to that a little bit in a moment. So now there's a verse at the end of this whole discourse, and by the way, it's great to read this passage in Capernaum where we have Mass, because as we're having Mass there, we look out the window and there is the synagogue in Capernaum, and at the end of this passage it said, Jesus spoke these words in the synagogue in Capernaum. So every time we're there, I do a 20-minute version of this talk at the synagogue. And so there, 
At the end of that passage, there's a verse that I used to pull out of my holster like a pistol and I used to pop all of you right in the head with it. Bam, bam, bam. Answer that, Catholic, because it says, Jesus said, these words that I speak to you are spirit and life. The flesh profits nothing. Okay, Catholics. I've listened to you go through this whole passage about eating flesh and drinking blood and the Eucharist and the Mass and everything else. Now you get to my verse. The flesh profits nothing. The words I speak to you are spirit and life. They're symbolic. But what is Jesus really saying here? He's saying that the words I speak to you are not easy to understand. They are spirit and life and truth. They're sacramental. They're a mystery. And the flesh profits nothing. What does Jesus mean by the flesh profits nothing? That's what I mean about studying the Bible. You come to a verse like this and say, my goodness, is he just denying everything he said in the whole chapter ahead? No, he's not. You look at the verse and you ask questions. What does Jesus mean the flesh? Does he mean his flesh? His flesh profits nothing? If you take that position, you have proved too much because you're saying that the incarnation that Jesus, God himself coming into a body was unnecessary because the flesh of Christ, you just said here, is unnecessary. The flesh profits nothing. The incarnation simply means incarn. What's carn? A carnivore eats what? Meat. Incarn means in flesh. If you deny, if you say that the flesh of Jesus profits nothing, you've just denied the gospel. You've just denied the need for Jesus, God himself becoming in flesh, becoming a man. You've denied the bodily resurrection at the end of time. You've proved too much. But what does Jesus mean here? The flesh profits nothing. All through John chapter 6, he says, my flesh, my flesh, my flesh. And then he changes it here in verse 63 to the flesh. This is why I love computerized Bible study. I joke around with people and said, as soon as I became Catholic, I never opened a Bible again. That's because I do it all on computer now. Even on my little handheld here, I have 10 translations of the Bible, Greek and Hebrew dictionaries, the catechism. You don't need to open a book anymore. It's at your fingertips and I can compare translations and I can do a search and I can say, search in the Gospel of John for anywhere it says, the flesh. Bingo, right there. First one my eyes drawn to is... John 8, 15. Jesus is arguing with the Jews again. And he says, you are judging in all these things, but you are judging wrong because you judge according to the flesh. What does he mean you judge according to the flesh? It's very simple. The Jews were trying to understand this with their fleshly mind. The word flesh means many things in the Bible. You have to translate it. It's always the word sarx, S-A-R-X. It's always the same word, but it's defined by its context. Sometimes it means all of life on the earth. Sometimes it means only mankind. Flesh being all of flesh sinned. Or it's, it can also mean meat. Like a steak on the table, flesh. It can also mean that which is part of our being separated from the revelation and the grace of God. So in other words, the flesh here is representing us with our carnal mind separated from the revelation of God. It's the flesh. We're trying to understand it in our own carnal fleshly mind. Some Bible translations, the New American Standard Bible and the Revised Standard say, you judge according to the flesh. It's very literal. But the NIV, the, the, the new Protestant darling New Testament, which is replacing the King James, says you judge according to human standards. The New American Bible, which is a Catholic translation, says you judge according to appearances. <laughs> appearances. You're judging according to appearances. And when you see this, you judge based on what your eyes tell you, that it's f- bread and wine. Jesus said, you're judging according to the flesh. He's arguing with these people. The flesh profits nothing. What do you mean by that? It means that with your own eyes, you cannot judge this properly. If you look at it and say it's bread and wine, you've judged it improperly. You have to judge it in a different way. 
Everything that exists in the world today, we cannot determine with our five senses. I like to say this. Right now, every one of you should know what the weather's going to be tomorrow and what the news is going on right now. Why? Because all of those TV channels, all of those radio signals are going right through your brain. But why don't you know the weather today or what it's going to be tomorrow? Because you don't have the technology to pick up those signals in your brain, do you? I have right here on this, this is also Wi-Fi and the internet. If there's a wireless internet, I can pick it up here. But it's also going through your brains, but you can't pick it up. Why? Because you don't have the technology to pick it up. Does that mean it doesn't exist? It, no, it just means according to the flesh, the five senses you have, you can't pick all this stuff up. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist any more than just because we can't see that this is the body and blood of Christ means it doesn't exist. A friend of mine named Jim Ball, I apologize to Margie, you can cover your ears. She said, you don't have to tell that story, do you? And I said, yes, I do. <laughs> a friend of mine, a scientist, he lives in Saline, Michigan, and when I became Catholic, he says to me, Steve, I'm a biochemist at Ford Motor Company, and I can prove to you that the Eucharist is not the body and blood of Christ. And I said, how can you do that? He said, with my microscope. He said, what I want you to do is go to Mass after you're a Catholic and I want you to eat the Eucharist. And an hour later, I want you to come up to my house and I want you to vomit it up and we're going to put it in my microscope. If it's still a carbohydrate, that means it's still bread. If it registers as a protein, then I'll go along with you that it's become flesh because obviously meat's a protein and bread's a carbohydrate. So what would you have said to him? I said, of course I'll do it. Remember who I am. I'm an adventurer. I have nothing to fear. I'm a Catholic. It's the truth. What do I have to fear from your microscope? But then I said at the same time, Lord, what should I tell him? And the Lord says, yes, but tell him this first. Tell him you want to first establish the basis for this experiment and what can a microscope actually determine? Got it, Lord. I knew exactly what to ask him. I said, okay, Jim, I'll do this with you. However, what I want to do first is I want you to give me... Um, a scientific basis of what we'll actually be able to determine with your microscope. And I'll say, Jim, this is an example I'd like you to explain to me. If you and I were walking down the Jordan Valley towards Jerusalem and Jesus was coming the other way, the curly-haired little Jewish guy with the dirty sandals and so on, unshaven, you know, that guy that looks just like a man, who looks just like a Jewish guy, and I walk up to him and say, are you Jesus? He says, yes. I take my Swiss Army knife out of my pocket and before he has a time to react, I cut the tip of his finger off. And I take the tip of his finger and I put it in your microscope, Jim. Would you be able to detect the divinity of Christ? He said, no. I'd only be able to detect his humanity. And I said, really? But you're a Baptist? Even by your theology, you will admit that Jesus is 100% man, which you could test with your microscope, but also that he's 100% God. And if you did your test, you'd have to deny that he is God. Because the flesh, the five senses, and the microscope, let's face it, is only the extenuation, extenuating of one of the senses, sight. Because if with the five senses, you can't prove that he's God, then you're going to, by this experiment, have to deny he's God. So what are we going to prove with the Eucharist, Jim? Oh, he says, touche, but I'll be back. <laughs> I do not believe that this is the body and blood of Christ because it smells like flesh and reeks like blood. I believe it because God tells me so and he has the technology to know a whole lot more than my five senses technology can tell me. Even for example, I heard this the other day, if you take a quarter out of your pocket, I don't have one, I'm poor, but if you take a quarter out of your pocket and you feel it, doesn't it feel solid? And yet it's not. If you look at it with a microscope, what is a quarter if you get down to it small enough? It's a whole bunch of atoms. And what are atoms? Protons, neutrons, and electrons spinning around in space. It's the gravity and the centrifugal force that holds it into a solid. But if you were to look at a quarter down smaller, 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 you would see that it's 99.9% .9 air and space. The substance of a quarter is air. It's space, and yet when you hold it, what does it look like? A solid thing. You can't put your finger, you can't bend it, it's solid. But your eyes are lying to you about the substance of the quarter. I can't see it with my eyes. How am I to judge what happens here? I'm going to believe God, what he says. 
I want to close because I have 15 minutes left or actually 10. He's getting ready. I used, you know, Clint Eastwood does this in the movies. He puts his coat back and like ready to pull. <laughs> so I'm convinced it is the real body and blood of Christ because he tells me so. If I found that the early Christians through the first 1,500 years doubted it and denied it and didn't practice it from the very beginning, then I'd have a problem with what we as Catholics teach today. But I see the Old Testament prepares us for it. The New Testament is the foundations of what we believe as Catholics and the whole teaching of the church, especially in the first centuries, believed what we believe and they never doubted it for 1,500 years. I believe it because God told me so. I believe it because of the constant faithful witness of the church which is infused with the Holy Spirit who knows a heck of a lot more than I do. And he is far above my five puny little senses. And he tells me that there are angels, I can't see them either. That a quarter is more air and space than it is substance, even though I can't tell that. Who am I to argue with God about what happens here on the altar? I'll die for what the Catholic Church teaches, what happens here on the altar. My grandson is Samuel Tarsisius. Samuel slept in front of the altar in the tabernacle in the Old Testament. Tarsisius died defending the Eucharist in the New Testament church. A little Roman boy said, I will not give up the Eucharist to the Roman soldiers. Give it to me. I will not give it to you. This is the body and blood of my Lord. Give it to me. No, we will kill you. Kill me. And they cut a, killed him and sliced him up. And my son named my grandson that in the year of the Eucharist. I'll die for what the Catholic Church teaches in front of the, about the Eucharist. Now I want to tell you about our first Mass and I'll close with this example. We had never been in a Catholic church. January 1st, 1994. We were studying and reading, my wife and I. We had all our books out, and we had been struggling with this for a year. And at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I said to my wife, I closed all my books, and I said, Janet, I'm a Catholic. We had never been in a church. We had never met a priest. We had never met a Catholic that could explain or defend their faith. I read my way into the Catholic Church through the Bible and the Fathers and theology and history. I read my way into the Catholic Church. And then I called Al Cresta, who you all know and love. And he had become a Catholic a year before. And when he had converted to the Catholic Church, he told me this. And we'd been best friends for 15 years before this as evangelicals. And I said to Al, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You're way too smart to be a Catholic, Al. But then I called him a year later when I decided to be a Catholic and I said, Happy New Year. It was New Year's Day, 2 o'clock. He says, Happy New Year, Steve. I said, Al, I'm a Catholic. He says, What? <laughs> Silence, actually, on the other end of the phone. Hello, Al, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. What did you just say? I said, I'm a Catholic. He said, I know that's what I thought I heard, but I never thought I'd ever hear you say that. He invited us that day. He said to me, How would you like to go to Mass with us tomorrow? It's Sunday. I covered the phone. I never dreamed for a second that if I was going to intellectually become a Catholic, I would have to go to a Catholic Mass eventually. <laughs> I never even, those two cells never connected. So I covered the phone and I said to my wife, Janet, Janet, quick, what should we do? And she says, tell Al that we'll go, but we're going to leave our kids at home. We're going to sit in the, we're going to get there late, sit in the back and leave early. And they said, we're real American Catholics right from the beginning. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, we never get up and leave before the final blessing because I'm a Catholic and I believe that the Mass is a Mass till it's over. And you know who's the first one that got up and left before the final blessing? Judas at the Last Supper. So Al took us to church that Sunday. It was actually Christ the King in Ann Arbor. It wasn't even a church, it was a warehouse. He hadn't built the church yet. 
And the reason I tell you this is because I saw for the first time in my life what was going on. I had read about it, but I saw for the first time in my life the Eucharist. And I explain this whole first Mass in my book, Crossing the Tiber. I go through the whole thing and explain what happened and the theology behind it. But after seeing Father Ed, the priest, for the first time coming down the aisle, I started to cry. And my wife started to cry because it's the first time in our life we'd ever seen an apostolic man. I've seen good Bible teachers, good preachers, good pastors, but I never saw an apostolic man in the apostolic succession. And when I turned and for the first time in my life saw a Catholic priest up close, I started to cry. And I cried through the whole Mass. And so did Janet. And I could go on and on about that first Mass, but I'll just tell you the part about the Eucharist. Five minutes. I'll tell you about the Mass. I saw this in my, heart, my mind. For the, I saw it completely. I understood it. Now, I had studied about the Eucharist because I'd already intellectually decided to be a Catholic. I knew what the church taught. I'd read the Fathers. I'd understood the biblical passages. And so I understood what the Eucharist was. But here, for the first time in my life, I saw it with my eyes. It's one thing to read a book about an elephant. It's another thing to walk around the corner and boom, bump right into one. You can explain an elephant a lot better after bumping into it than you can just by reading about it. And so here I am sitting in the math and I'm watching. I don't understand all that's going on. As far as I'm concerned, the priest was just up there doing his thing, folding his hands, this, that, holding this up, shaking this, blowing smoke here and there. And I, you know, to me, it was the first time I'd ever seen this. The priest is up there putting on the show. But when the Eucharist came, I understood what was going on because my mind, I started arguing like with myself like I would have before. My old Steve Ray said, this is sacrilege, this is idolatry, it's stupid. And the other side of me says, no, this is the body and blood of Christ. And then the other side says, don't you remember in the Bible it says that Jesus was crucified once and for all. He's not crucified over and over on the altar. I used to use that against Catholics all the time. Why do you sacrifice him here all the time? You say it's a sacrifice. Jesus was crucified once and for all on the cross. Says it so three times in Hebrews and once in 1 Peter. And the reason you come here every Sunday is because you don't read your Bibles. If you'd read your Bibles, you'd understand that this is a sacrilege and it's unbiblical. But then again, on the other side of my mind, I remembered in Revelation 13, verse 8, in the two best Protestant translations, King James and NIV and others, it says that Jesus Christ was crucified before the foundations of the world. Well, let me explain this. I was right when I said Jesus was crucified once and for all in space and time. There's no doubt he was crucified in 30 AD in Jerusalem, space and time. But it was in space and time that's the key. Imagine that God is in eternity and he creates a creation. It's like a bubble. He creates this bubble and inside is space and time, the continuation of events from beginning to end. You can't be here and there at the same time. All of these limitations we live with that God doesn't, and then one time, God decided to come down into the bubble and be one of us. Bloop! He drops right into the bubble. He lives here for 33 years. He suffers, dies, and ra- dies at spa- in one time in space and time on the cross in Jerusalem. And when you go there, you can still touch the place where the blood dripped. And then after he rose from the dead, bloop, he went back up out of the bubble and he's back in eternity again. We're still stuck in the bubble. He's not. And in Revelation 13, 8, it says that, I, that Jesus was crucified before the foundations of the world. How could he have been crucified before the foundations of the world if he was crucified in 30 AD? And then you read in Revelation 5, verse 5, looking into the future, it says, Behold, I saw a lamb standing as though slain on the altar before the throne of God. Is the lamb standing as though slain with his throat slit. There's a lamb standing on the altar with his throat slit, but he's alive. My favorite painting in the world is called The Adoration of the Lamb by Van Eck. And it's in Ghent, Belgium, and I went all the way to there to see it one time. And it is a lamb standing in an altar out in a field, and his throat is slit, but he's standing there majestically, and blood is gushing out of his throat into a chalice. And people from all the world, love different colors and languages and tribes, are all coming to adore the lamb. Right from Revelation 5, verse 5 in the New Testament. There in eternity, future, if there's such a thing, stands the lamb of God slain. It's the crucifix. 
I put up a blog one time about a year ago. You could still read it on my website, catholicconvert.com. And it's called, What God Sees When He Opens His Eyes in the Morning. He sees the sacrifice, the lamb. He sees the crucifix, the slain one with the wounds still in his hands and throat slit. The lamb of God, the Passover lamb. That's what God sees when he opens his eyes every morning. And then I realized it wasn't just that he was crucified before the foundations of the world and that in the future he's still in the throne before God. But 1 John chapter 2 verse 2 says that if you sin, come to the, to, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is our propitiatory sacrifice. Not that he was in the future. He is right now, present tense, our sacrifice. He's right now before the throne of God like this, presented as an offering before the throne. I realized all of that at my first Mass. It was in space and time, but God is outside of space and time. So in God's mind, in God's eyes, it is an eternal event. And what happens on the altar... When the priest, Father Steve or Father John, come out here, they look just like average guys, except they have a collar. But they're not. Their souls have been changed by ordination, by the sacrament, by the Holy Spirit. And when they come out here in persona Christi, they hold up a piece of bread, and they hold up a chalice of wine. But what happens when they pray over that is that one, it's not another sacrifice. It's not Jesus being offered again over and over as another sacrifice. We are now celebrating what is eternally the one eternal sacrifice that's always before the eyes of God. That one eternal sacrifice comes slamming down through space and time onto that altar and we partake of eternity. That which was before the foundations of the world and which is until the end of time will now comes down as an eternal event right on the altar and we get to partake of eternity. That's what the Mass is. That's what happens at the altar. And I'll close with this example. The sun rises every morning, does it not? Is it a new sun that comes up every day? Does God make a new sun? Is it a new, different sun every morning? It's not. If you go out, say, into eternity, so to speak, like on the space shuttle, and you go out, you will see the sun is always there, always bright, always shining, never goes away. But for us, in space and time, it comes new every day. But it's not a new sun. It's the same eternal sun that continues to be presented to us new every morning. The Eucharist, the suffering, the sacrifice of Christ is not another sacrifice, a new one every day here. It is the one eternal event that comes new every day and in a way renews itself or represents itself like the sun every morning for us. This is the Eucharist. This is not Baptist. This is Catholic. And this is why I love the Eucharist and why I love being Catholic and why I will spend the rest of my life defending and teaching the Catholic faith. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.